two weeks ago in our first seminar, uh, Climate Change and Politics, Larry Lohman discussed the ways in which uh, the politics of climate change have been framed in ways that really accommodate Western points of views, but largely neglect the ways in which climate issues um, relate to the livelihoods of communities in other parts of the world. <clears throat> Last week, uh, in the Climate Change and Development Seminar, Dr. Andrew Newsham um, discussed climate change in relation to globalization and, uh, and in relation to how uh, it's becoming increasingly cru crucial to address the discrepancy between, <clears throat> those between the impact on those responsible for climate change and those least responsible but most affected by it. <clears throat> Tonight, uh, in this climate change and law seminar, our objective is to attempt to understand how climate issues are addressed through legal frameworks and how especially environmental justice is undermined uh, by many of the cur current initiatives in mainstream climate discourse. <clears throat> this talk will be 45 minutes and uh, we, it will be followed by a session of questions, answers and discussions in which we hope that many of you will participate. <clears throat> if you want to tweet about the seminars, please use the hashtag climate perspective. And now it is my honor to present to you our speaker for this seminar, uh, Dr. Faye Lesniowska. Bea is a senior teaching fellow at the SOAS School of Law and the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, and she's a co-founder of the Law, Environment, and Development Center. She's also a research associate in EU uh, energy, uh, energy Law and Policy at Queen Mary University, and she's previously worked as a Law and Policy Advisor at Client Earth, which is a not-for-profit environmental uh, law organization. Bea completed her PhD in International Law and Forests in China, and her research focuses on climate change law, sustainable development, ecosystems law, and indigenous people's rights. She's done field work in West Africa, East Asia, Russia, on issues such as illegal timber trade, community tenure rights, and Red Plus. A couple of times I've had the pleasure of meeting Faya. She's always been, uh, she's always been just come from something or rushing off to some, something else, so safe to say, very busy, so we are very honored that you've been willing to take the time to support and participate in the series. Um, and now I'd like to just hand over to Faya, and uh, please give a warm welcome to Faya Lizniowska. Well, good evening, and thanks for inviting me to, to give this presentation, this talk. Uh, it's a huge... Talk. <laughs> it's a huge subject. I mean, we have we have the climate change law and energy policy LLM course, and of course that's 40 hours long, and it's too short. <laughs> we don't cover enough. We don't even do cities. Um, we we have to break things up and not cover enough material in in relationship, say, to looking in depth at case law in relationship to litigation and things like that. So it's all, well, once I sat down and thought, okay, right, climate change and law, I, it struck me that I was overwhelmed with exactly what to, <laughs> what to talk about. And I, I wanted to pitch this in a way that one wasn't patronizing to you as people who probably know a fair amount about climate change governance, the international climate change regimes, um, we've already obviously had the first two talks and there's an inevitable overlap between the different social sciences, so between, you know, politics and development and as you'll see next week with economics, all these interface and law is like, is at the forefront but is also an architect and a technician, so it helps create in terms of the normative framing but then it's also involved in the technicalities of delivering the regulatory structures to achieve certain objectives. The law is kind of everywhere. It's involved in development. It's very political. Some people would say law isn't political, but they're likely to be like technical people, very technical legal people. Um, so what I recognize and, and uh, with the publicity that went out it was like we're going to cover international regional national law damage human rights trade security litigation it's enormous right so we're not going to cover everything in great detail 
What I'd like to do is not spend a huge amount of time uh, speaking. I'd like to have a really good conversation about what we think law can do and what we believe law is doing. Yeah, there's a lot of expectation about law. I, mean, I, I kind of had it when I first started, and my faith in law has been tempered somewhat you know, over the years. <clears throat> I'll move this on just for the, yeah. So climate change, obviously, it exists. Climate exists. It's there. It's been changing for millennia. But climate change in terms of the story about climate change as a new tragedy of the commons began back in the late 1980s. Now, the reason I call it the new tragedy of the commons, this was the emergence very much linked to technologies in the late 1960s. So we have the moon landing. Not long after the moon landing, we have the moon treaty in 1972. The first multilateral environmental agreement about common concern, common heritage rather, of the moon. So nobody can go and extract from the moon uh, minerals, right? This is being, these things are being challenged now because it's cheaper to go to the moon. The desire to get the uh, minerals is greater because of the lack, uh, the scarcity, perceived scarcity on Earth. There's also the deep sea um, minerals. Now, deep sea minerals, again, back in the uh, early 1970s, this became a really contentious issue, particularly because the uh, most valuable deep sea minerals tended to be in the global south. But the money to extract from the deep sea bed and the technologies lay in the global north, right? So a deep sea bed declaration at the UN was agreed, and it was recognized that they were of common heritage and that nobody could extract deep sea bed minerals for private gain, for commercial use. Again, that is actually under threat now. If you go on the Law of the Sea website, you'll see that there's lots of uh, issues and claims about accessing deep seabed um, minerals. Main countries are emerging economies. Right? China's one of the biggest, right? So these are for rare earth metals, particularly, what's interesting, the technologies that we would use to address climate change, so renewable energy. And then finally, the big one was uh, the depletion in the ozone, the hole in the ozone. Of course, the technologies that detected the hole in the ozone were satellite technologies. Those technologies also fed into early um, scientific data to determine the fact that climate change was occurring, right? So there, is an inter there are linkages between the discovery about the hole in the ozone and the start of the climate change, awareness around climate change. So the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone was addressed by the Vienna Convention, but most notably the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol, uh, agreed in the late 1980s, was seen to be the masterpiece of the way to go to resolve uh, issues of common heritage, common concern rather, amongst the global states. Yeah? There were targets, there were identified gases, and everybody agreed there was differentiation between the uh, developed countries and the non-developing countries. And this was very important in terms of the negotiations for the, uh, the UN Convention on Climate Change and the subsequent attempt uh, to develop the Kyoto Protocol, the way that that's been developed. So that's the kind of big story. We have a period of time when we're perceiving common threats, right? Now, I'm articulating it in a certain way, right? This is retrospectively. We are perceiving common threats, right? Who was perceiving these common threats? Who was setting those agendas? So the 
The contention around international environment related law is that those agendas were very much being set by the global north. But there was this contestation between the global north and the global south over resources. They were resources apart from the ozone. It wasn't a resource, but the whole was uh, uh, due to refrigerator, refrigerators and CFCs. So it was linked to development. Yeah? It was linked to sovereignty, right to development, and the fact that businesses were involved who were in the global north who could say, right, we've changed how we're producing something, we'll go ahead with this treaty. It led to more and more tensions between the global north and global south. But this isn't a lecture about um, the history of environmental law. So we shall go on. The reason those uh, are here, common heritage, as I said, is um, the idea that we collectively have an interest, common concern to believe, common but differentiated responsibilities. Like I said, in the Montreal Protocol, this was the first time within a legally bound, binding treaty that you had a recognition that there was a difference between the contribution to the problem and therefore a differentiation in the solution. Yeah? So grandfathering approaches were introduced. Right? The polluter pays. In climate change, this is a very big question. Who is the polluter? And how are they paying? And who are they paying? Precaution. Once you have knowledge that your actions are going to have an impact, should you continue to undertake those actions that are having an impact? Particularly if those actions are having an impact beyond your territory. Yeah? Uh, you know, so if you set fire, you know full well that if you set fire to your neighbor's house, it will burn down and it will put their, their lives at risk. Should you be held accountable for that action? Yeah? But in the, in the international law, this is problematic, transboundary harm as it's referred to, because you've got to attribute your actions to the cause and the problem. And it's not that straightforward. And this, a clear example is forests uh, in Indonesia burning and causing uh, smoke uh, pollution in Singapore, Malaysia, and China. And the effort to try and take that to court to hold them liable for the nuisance, they're using tort law, for the nuisance caused to uh, the citizens in their country. So it's sort of like a class action, uh, the impact, health impacts from several months worth of forest fires burning. Yeah? And then we have uh, wise use of sustainable development. This was a, a sort of mega norm that had emerged by the early 1990s. Um, and it was this collective idea that we could, as a whole, as a, as a, as a global, body of states come together and use the, uh, use the resources that we have in a way that is sustainable, but also contributes to development. Nobody's left behind. It perpetuates the idea that we can continue to progress, right? And what climate change is doing to law and is not recognized, is it has brought law to a tipping point. Because law is based on this idea that we are in control. And we are in control of the earth. And the earth is something that we do too, not that it does something to us. And law is constructed now in a way and I'm saying this in, in, in terms of, sort of sovereign, sovereign law, international law, I'm putting to one side customary indigenous peoples, uh, other, and also religious um, law, yeah? where this 
is more complex here, yeah. but often that's not part of the narrative. And when Bruno Latour is talking, he is talking about our relationship through our, uh, our ideological frameworks and settings, and law is the rule book for that, right? And so we are now in a position where the earth is starting to get back to at us. It's upsetting the apple cart of a particular framing of the way in which we uh, understand how law operates. Like law is something that is essentially established to provide certainty, is to provide outcomes that are predictable. Yeah? You want to know that when you implement laws, the outcome will be understood, it will be repeated again and again. You don't want uncertainty and you don't want extreme risk. And law has not had to deal with that, aside from perhaps extreme wars, uh, periodically over the centuries. You know? And then we have martial law and things like that. So laws really at a tipping point and very strained and threatened. And this isn't recognized. It isn't recognized in many ways within uh, people that are working on climate change, a lot of people, because it's very hard to take on board. And it definitely isn't recognized by the majority of the legal profession globally, and it definitely isn't recognized by policymakers and politicians. Yeah? When they think about climate change, it's not about destabilization of the whole of the way in which society and governance operates. The reason I want to talk about time is because the idea of law, as we know it, is linear. We are moving towards a point. That point is one of progress. The law that we work with, in terms of international law, universal law, human rights law, trade law, environmental law, it's all moving towards a better point. We are all trying to achieve a better end goal. We all believe that end goal is possible. We all believe in the progress. That is what modernism and law of modernism, liberal law of the state, sells us. It's what we believe in. And even when we have so much evidence that that is not the case, we still hold on to that belief. We believe we are moving in a single linear arrow towards an end point. But what's very difficult about time, even when you think of it in a linear sense, because when it's portrayed in this sense, there's an end point. And I don't think there is an end point myself in a linear sense. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But what happens when you use this sort of imagery, and it's very common within sort of the Anthropocene idea, is that we feel either paralyzed, we can't do anything, or we must do something, and it kind of doesn't matter what it is. As long as something's done, we will be getting there. And as the window to do something, in terms of climate change, gets smaller, anything goes. So then we move into sort of geoengineering. So obviously with the Paris Agreement, we have a target, we want to get to that target, we have timelines. We have up to 2050, 
variations in economic modeling from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We're all sort of biting our nails going, oh no, when the next IPCC report comes out, what's it going to say? Is it going to say we have less time? Does that mean we're going to have to take more extreme measures because we have to beat the clock and we have to make sure that we beat the clock in a way that we keep progress growing? Can we think in any other way? And I think it's very difficult. I mean, I was here for Larry's talk and about decolonizing ourselves. It's very hard when you work and operate in an environment, a society, a world that operates in this way to think and act in a different way. You can write about it, but it's very hard to realize it in your life and create it in law. <clears throat> this also doesn't take on board the extreme risk and uncertainty. We still believe that if we do certain things, so one of my hobby horses is carbon capture and storage. If we could only build 400 carbon capture and storage units within the space of 20 years of a certain size, get them built, we can sequester enough carbon and have business as usual in terms of our lifestyle. There's no accounting for the impacts of climate change, the effects of extraction of natural resources to build these things, the location of these things and the impacts on ecosystem services. There's no one thinking about that. So when you go, when we, I mean, we looked at this in class. When you look at the, yeah, uh, you might be a carbon capture and storage de devotee. So <laughs> when we look at these things in, when you look at the website of the Carbon Capture and Storage Global Network advocacy body, they're not thinking in a way that takes on risk and uncertainty. They use some of that language to try to justify the regulatory changes that are needed, but they don't take it on board in terms of their actual vision in a broader context. So there's a perpetual denial that is fostered by this approach of linearity and shutting down. We foreclose options by continually looking in this way and taking this approach. Yeah? And what's... Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Now there, as I said at the beginning, there's enormous, um, there are enormous challenges. But those challenges have different priorities because there's competing narratives and there's competing power and inequities We've spoken about that a bit earlier, as you summarized the differentiation between the global north and the global south in terms of political power. There's differentiation in terms of accessing even the climate change agenda. So the emphasis is on mitigation. Mitigation happens to be where technology is, where money is, adaptation gets less attention. Loss and damage, which is the idea that there is some sort of restitution for the fact that certain uh, countries, small island developing states, and low-lying uh, coastal areas, that they are going to need to be moved. They need to be recognized that the impacts, like this is Hurricane Haiyan in the Philippines, the cost of that, no compensation. I mean, this goes back to the polluter pays principle. Who's paying for this? Who's paying for this damage? 
And where does it come up in the sort of hierarchy? The point that was raised in Larry, Larry Lohman's talk, and I think I feel very strongly about this, I think there's a, an inequity in response, and it's geographical, and it's racial. There's those that are almost, almost the poor and the vulnerable can be dispensed with. Their lives are less valuable. Now, of course, in law, that's not true, because in law, we've got human rights, and in human rights, everybody's equal, and everybody's life is valuable, and we believe in that, and we believe that everybody's life should be saved, and we should invest in new drugs to ensure that people will stay alive and things. But we all know about the inequity in sort of distribution of healthcare. The distribution of impacts of climate change are not... Uh, um, matched by the distribution and resources to address the impacts. And the justification is mitigation is still the primary issue. And mitigation has to happen in the greatest emitting countries, and they're the ones with the resources, and also they're the ones with the best governance structures and laws, and they can bring in law, bring in things. Uh, they can initiate new markets they can initiate um, the appropriate regulatory structures, new uh, standards, and uh, adhere to these standards. Yeah? And that's a real problem. I don't know if, how um, Andrew dealt with the, the issue about the way in which development is, is addressing uh, climate change. But we do have the sort of notion of sort of a, um, new worlds, new cities, Everybody's very hopeful about cities. There's uh, the, um, the, uh, the mayor, what's it called? The city mayors, there's 40 cities that have got together and uh, have committed to reduce their emissions to zero emissions by, I think it's 2050. And um, they are spread throughout the world, yeah? So this idea that cities can be centers where you have development, you meet human rights, you have a new vision, a new world. There's an um, event called Habitat, and Habitat 3, back last year, predicted that 75, yeah, about 70, 75% of the global population by 2050 will be living in cities. That's a massive change in the governance structures of how we're going to live. There's lots of legal issues about this. If you vacate the territories beyond cities, how are they going to be administered? Who is going to be controlling them? What's going to happen to the other third? Are the other third going to still be uh, the indigenous peoples uh, and communities? Are they going to take on roles to manage the sequestration capacity of land and forests? If they do, do they have to take on contracts and then liability in a sense of being a, a contractor who has a responsibility to deliver a service? And they deliver that service to a buyer in a city who buys emission reductions from the forest dwellers. These are all visions that are extraordinarily complex. And again, it goes back to this issue of the straight line and that we're just sort of going to get there somehow. Building all these cities, where are all the resources going to come from? Where is all the power coming from? How are they going to... Uh, what, is, what is labor going to do? And another one of my favorites is, where does uh, the automation fit in? Robots coming in. Like, you very rarely get a discussion about robots and climate change together, but it needs to happen. That's one of my... The thing about robots, governance over robots and law and robots, climate change and human beings and work and labor and value and a rising population. There's no, I don't have any answers. I, it's just, it's just, these are the sort of things that keep me awake at night. I just, you know. But there's these competing priorities. 
And like I say, you know, mitigation uh, takes priority. Mitigation has become dominated by market-based approaches. We've all heard of emissions trading schemes where you have a unit of carbon, one ton of carbon is equivalent to something. Is it equivalent to a certain number of trees sequestering over a certain period of time? Is it equivalent to not burning a certain amount of coal and then that being traded? And where, where does the value come in? The value comes in as long as you're bringing, uh, if you have a cap, on the amount that can be emitted, then the value rises. So you need more and more markets for it to actually function, for it to work. And we are seeing that. We're seeing more and more markets. And the Paris Agreement encourages more markets. Its language is a bit tempered because of the opposition to market-based mechanisms among some of the southern states, particularly in Latin America. But it's there. And the, uh, the the train is out of the station. It's gone. Yeah? Those that don't want market-based mechanisms, forget it. They're there. They're not going to disappear. Yeah? But there's, other, there's so many other things, and it was on the list of things for me to talk about. So security. The anxieties around security. The change in the sense of security and climate change being something that it will possibly lead and accentuate existing conflicts in areas that are already uh, stressed to a militarized sense of security where we're beginning to and this feeds into the narrative now of building walls I, I was at an event yesterday and I was asking a guy that works on European energy about energy security and refugees climate change refugees and displacement how are they actually factoring in the, 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 the numbers, the expectation, the, globally the expectation is around 200 million uh, climate change refugees by 2050. How do you factor that movement of people into your plans? Again, it's the whole linear thing. Things aren't going to change. We're going to build CCS plants, we're going to create this. We're going to, what about the movement of peoples? What about the impact of rising temperatures on infrastructure, on people's health, on crops, on therefore trade patterns? And he's trying to work with that. And how does law work with that? Because law is pretty slow and wants predictability and wants to offer a framework for people to engage in either control over property, control over contracts and exchange of uh, services, uh, administration of functions of governance. Obviously, we've got human rights, uh, another big one, and we've mentioned tech. The, 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 so there's lots of things, so we're going to but we do have climate change law and there's lots of books about climate change law and there's lots of articles and um, the what's so this is the LSE have uh, spent time in the past since about 2012 I think gathering climate change legislation Right, and policy and counting it throughout the world and identifying it. So one of the big questions is, what constitutes climate change legislation? Does it have to have the word climate change in it? Does it have to merely affect in a way that is contributing to mitigation and abatement? Or is it, would you include something that is definitely contributing to adaptation? So the definition of what constitutes climate change law itself is very, you know, it's very problematic. Lots of law contributes to climate change. Investment law contributes to climate change, but often in a negative sense, yeah? But we see that we've got lots of, uh, well, quite a lot, 
854 climate laws and policies, which you might go, that's very encouraging. Most of those are our energy sector. So most of those are in countries that have existing uh, energy infrastructure and it's building up the renewable energy sector. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's well over uh, the 854, there's well over half to two thirds are related to renewable energy and uh, alternative energy sources. Alternative energy, would you include in your climate change legislation fracking? It's a lower carbon according to certain measurements, um, or would you not? There's much less uh, legislation that's around adaptation and around uh, land use and land use change in forestry. Yeah? Am I? point is that what constitutes climate change law when you're looking for documenting climate change law? I mean, obviously, um, a very helpful one is the UK, which is called the Climate Change Act. So that's like, yes, that must be climate change. Yeah? Uh, although the UK is soon possibly going to be up in front of a, a court for failing to deliver policies uh, to meet the climate change budget target uh, under the regulation. Uh, they have at, um, targets that they're supposed to be meeting and policies that the UK have are definitely not going to meet those uh, targets. <coughs> How are we doing time-wise? Am I doing... Ten more minutes. Right. So, um, so, in terms of classic narrative, so international law and climate change and what I wanted to avoid was to come here and talk about in this year this happened in this year but we do know in 1997 the Kyoto Protocol was agreed Kyoto Protocol basically looked to the Montreal Protocol as a template upon which to resolve a problem an atmospheric problem global commons problem but the complexity of climate change is not the same as addressing ozone depleting substances. You had like six gases, ozone depleting gases, you could identify them and you could set targets and you could differentiate quite easily and it didn't affect the whole of the infrastructure and the way in which society lives. The Kyoto Protocol was trying to do the same, identify five gases, include those gases under targets, those most responsible, differentiated, take on uh, responsibilities, legally binding responsibilities for emission reductions under those targets that they decide on their own, uh, and the target only being a 5% reduction, everybody knew it was inadequate, but it was like, well, this gets us going. Again, the idea, we're on the we're on the train of progress towards the point that we're trying to get to. So it doesn't matter that we're spending a lot of time and resources to agree this thing, and we know it's inadequate, but we'll, we'll go with it. So when Kyoto got agreed in 1997, there was euphoria. I mean, there was a real sense of, uh, this is fantastic. We've, we've, we, know, we know it's a bit substandard, but we're on our way, right? And it's an international agreement, everybody's agreed, there's some legally binding bits, and we've recognized differentiation. Um, so the developing world can keep developing. Uh, that's great, yeah. <clears throat> As we know, America didn't sign up. Uh, it didn't actually enter into force until much later in 2005. And um, it brought in a lot of the market-based mechanisms but what is fascinating is, again, we've got the Paris Agreement. It's heralded as a major achievement, 
when people talk about it, it's like everybody's involved, everybody's got um, some commitment, the nationally determined contributions, which aren't legally binding. When we add up all the nationally determined contributions that aren't legally binding, we're going to go 2.7 to 3.4. We were trying to go 1.5 to 2. But it's great. It's a, we're on the way. <laughs> we're on the way. And it's an internationally legally binding. Everybody's involved. Let's celebrate. It's great. And again, it falls into that rhetoric of we believe that we can make progress with this. It's based on progress. It's based on a ratcheting mechanism. Every five years, we report. Our reports will be very honest. We can trust them from everybody. There will be no double counting. There will be no inaccuracies. They will tell us exactly what we need to know. And then we can increase our ambition. And then we will move along sequentially in a very linear fashion and achieve by 2050 the goal because we will have increased our ambition and we will have got to 1.5. So within the space of six months, it was made very clear that we is almost in, almost like 98% unlikely that we're going to have a, get 1.5 at all. We are already over 1% in terms of uh, global warming uh, beyond pre-industrial uh, temperatures. Um, so 1.5 is almost certain to happen. Some people are saying it's going to happen by 2020. Um, that has massive ramifications for tipping points, implications for the most vulnerable, small island states, etc. Where, where is law now for these things? There is a great deal of discussion about how are we going to manage uh, climate refugees and displacement. It actually gets one mention in the climate in the Paris Agreement, and it only gets one mention in the preamble. Not even warranted, and it's within other it's indigenous peoples, human rights. We recognise they're important, but it doesn't warrant a section. And where you do have a recognition, which is the loss and damage mechanism, um, that's tempered by another uh, paragraph in the whole Paris decision, which says, well, hang on, you know, we, we recognize that there's going to be loss and damage. There's a mechanism, we'll track it, we'll report about it, but you, you, nobody's getting any compensation. Nobody's getting anything from anybody, right? So, um, again, a celebration of a mechanism, of a triumphalism, of achievement in international law, which is giving indicators, because everybody's like, well, now we've got the Paris Agreement, all the other laws can start happening, you know. But there'll be laws to, to realise an agreement that isn't arguably fit for purpose and perpetuates this denialism. Um, so within this moving forward, and there are seen to be opportunities, and that those that are in favour of sort of climate justice and believe that this is an opportunity to redress balances, imbalances, uh, you know, inequities that have existed. So see, since pre-colonial times and colonial times, and perhaps this is the time we can actually create new structures and new ways of doing things and new ideas, et cetera, et cetera, that this gives us an opportunity and a space and a forum. Um, yes, but I don't see that happening to the level that it would be needed. And in terms of law, what laws are we talking about in terms of, in a, in a global sense? Uh, if we're moving away from the international legal order and moving away from the international legal system, there's a guy, Donald Trump's quite keen on moving away from that 
and we get quite anxious because we've, we're quite attached to human rights, international order that maintains ideas that we're quite attached to. And then there's the people that are like, well, actually, this really is only going to happen if we invest and recognize that profit incentives, profit motives are the things that will attract the big uh, pockets to put money in, to change away from the, the emissions industries to new low carbon industries. Eh? So everybody loves uh, the, the new big investors. You know, um, some of my favorites is Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk, he, I mean, his, his latest being the uh, roof, and came out the other day and said, yep, yeah, the roof is going to be cheaper than a normal roof. So where are all the resources coming from to build these roofs? Um, who are they going to be targeted at? Who has these types of roofs? Uh, what kind of houses are we talking about? Same with the kind of cars. It's a business as usual type of economy with the green technologies and it doesn't address social etc aspects are the social inequities and this is a sort of Naomi Klein perspective are the social inequities part of a problem and if they are then how do you address those in a way that you're actually moving in terms of away from low car uh, away from carbon based technologies because you, you do need to invest in technologies. There is a technological dimension to it, whether you like technologies or not. Everybody here, I'm sure, has an iPhone or a phone of some kind. We're, engaged, we're part of it, and it's trying to work that out. Um, <clears throat> so this is my final slide, and this is the uh, appropriate person to have, possibly on uh, International Women's Day. She wrote the manifesto, the Cyborg Manifesto, back in the 1980s. And that was about the relationship between society and technology. Um, and it was a sort of very feminist kind of critique. And she's just written a very interesting book, which is a critique of the Anthropocene, the concept of the Anthropocene. Because the concept of the Anthropocene itself is this idea that we now are in a time where human beings are having such a big effect on the planet that we can now also control our effect on the planet. That we, this goes away from the sort of Bruno Latour idea, that we can work out a way in which to uh, manage the planet, and in managing the planet, you need regulation, you need rules, you need standards, you will probably curtail certain human rights because people can't do things, people can do things. It, it would be a complete top-down management system with this idea of control. The Anthropocene is about control. We've been out of control, we now need to be controlled. The boundaries. There's a certain amount of stuff, there's a certain amount of carbon, a certain amount of water, and it will get allocated. And our argument, and, and some people argue that, okay, that can happen in a very socialist, kind of top-down, almost communist sense. It can happen in a, where we have the sort of capital of scene sense, um, where allocation is through the market. And her argument is that the world is basically more complex. We are part of a great complexity, and we cannot control that complexity. And that has a lot of messages for law. How does law work with complexity? How do we move away from legal modernism, the, mod the, the control of international law of states, international law of states managing the environment. So we have our multilateral environment agreements, biodiversity, desertification, um, uh, what are the ones that? <laughs> stuff on forests, 
uh, air quality, you know, uh, to ozone, etc. And so we're trying to manage all these different things. Yeah? And the, the idea of the Anthropocene is we keep managing things. But our relationship is going to be so challenged by the impacts of climate change within the next 50 years that our relationship to the Earth, in the sense that Latour has talked about, that it is engaging with us in a way that we have not had to engage with it before for a very long time, will force a change in the way, the paradigm of law. Now, there definitely are peoples who live and have legal systems that engage with uh, the natural world in ways that are more uh, uh, interconnected than our systems in terms of so, uh, civil and Roman um, custom, common law systems. So the this, this sense of listening to indigenous peoples, uh, understanding traditional knowledge, which of course is challenged by climate change because this, the context is shifting, but still the way of understanding and hearing is something we can, we can uh, learn from. And Donna Haraway's um, book looks to, she uses the word critters, like she's from uh, California, so it talks about insects and things in the ocean, uh, things that are, have got multiple legs and strange colors, and that there is going to be a big liberation in some ways of how we interact and perceive the environment and the way in which law will conceive and construct itself. This isn't going to happen in a linear fashion. This isn't going to happen by 2050. It's going to happen in locations. It's going to emerge. And as she says, we have to stay with the trouble because there is trouble, and as lawyers, we need to react and engage with that trouble in ways that are more creative and imaginative than we have previously. And, and so that will be the end of our denial. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks so much, Bea, for this, um, I'd say, profound analysis of um, problems between classical ideas of what law is and the challenges now proposed by, uh, by climate change. Um, we'll now move on to our uh, questions and discussions part. Um, and uh, I just want to say briefly that uh, I understand that many of you, and myself included when I ask questions, want to give a lot of background information for why I'm asking this specific question and stuff. But just being conscious of time, we'd like to ask you to keep your questions as brief as possible so that we can accommodate as many people as possible. Um, we're going to, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Maybe take a few questions at a time and then, uh, and Faya, if you could just, when you're answering the questions, just repeat them into the, oh, right. yeah. Oh, right. okay. okay. um, so we'll get to sit down. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. <clears throat> yeah, 
So, in terms of public interest litigation, um, what's very interesting about public interest litigation is how it's being used in different parts of the world. Uh, it's the opportunities and the spaces to uh, address environment and climate related issues using the courts and um, using procedural mechanisms vary obviously across the world depending on the opportunities in terms of the, um, the legal system, the governance system. So there's definitely places where that's completely foreclosed, right? <laughs> um, there are moments when there are possibilities to achieve advances in public interest litigation and India has been very good at a particular point in time and then often again it gets shut down. There's a, a backlash against uh, judicial activism. It's a term that's been used here by uh, the current government against uh, judicial activism in a human rights context. Um, investment in litigation and I think we we'll mentioned the yeah tomorrow the talk by Fahana Yaman uh, about the use of litigation post Paris. In terms of climate change litigation, there's been a, over time particular cases. So there's been cases brought by the Inuit uh, in the circumpolar region, and they took it to the American. Um, the American Regional Human Rights Council for uh, Commission, rather. And the idea was to begin to actually get stories heard. It's get narratives heard. So in terms of that, that was about indigenous peoples and um, their story about the impacts of climate change. A lot of time, public interest litigation don't ever think that case is going to be uh, a success but it's about getting the stories heard and getting those stories heard cumulatively. And there is now pretty much a global strategy amongst litigation lawyers to develop litigation cases to advance um, different areas and different issues on climate change. So you have civil case litigation, against corporate companies, you have litigation against uh, governments for constitutional, uh, uh, failing on the constitutional uh, obligations, um, you have litigation against governments, and this would be the case in the UK, for failing on a procedural obligation in terms of um, the uh, Climate Change Act. So there's these new linked up public interest global litigation strategies going on um, and like we've got one going on in well there's two going on in america obviously this one the exxon attempt to hold accountable for prior knowledge of um the impacts of their actions on to climate change and this goes back to the polluter pays it goes back to precautionary principles so sort of normative thing. There are massive hurdles to be addressed if you want to be successful because in a, in essentially these are tort cases, you have to prove relationships, you have to prove causation, um, and it's very, very difficult. There are attempts to do this now, but um, it's very, very hard. But there are, in terms of like, public interest litigation regarding uh, obligations through constitutional obligations. There was the Dutch case two years ago. Uh, there's just been a case in Vienna, uh, in Austria. There was uh, a judgment that a third runway couldn't be built because it was against the public interest. The impacts of climate change are much greater than the economic benefits that's going to be appealed, but it's a that outcome is really significant again as a story. It's a big move to suddenly say, actually, the 
impacts of climate change are more damaging than the economic benefits of having a new runway at this airport. Because that changes our ideas and thinking. And then there's one in, uh, where is it? Is it Oregon? Uh, there's going to be future generations uh, case um, where they, I think they've included, yeah, they've included Donald Trump, that he's failing again on a constitutional front with, uh, uh, so a lot of the time, I mean, I know with uh, Client Earth and the, the, um, the clean air, uh, the work that they've been doing against uh, the UK about air quality, they've been doing that since they started. Like when they started, and there was only about four lawyers, <coughs> That was the first thing that they started with. And they've still been doing it, you know. It's actually a guy who came to SOAS and did an LLM, Alan Andrews, who is the uh, lead lawyer in Client Earth working on that. So you can go places. <laughs> um, he, he didn't want to work on forest because he thought it was a bit too broad. <laughs> and, uh, um, They've been chipping away at that. You just have to keep, you have dedicate your life to these things, you know. Uh, it's not one in a moment, it's a dedication. And it's, de it's a dedication to changing a huge, huge system and trying to change the moral and political framing for understanding how we're going to create rules and regulations. Yeah. So it, it's very, very important. And so I encourage you to come to the talk tomorrow. Uh, what can individuals do? Obviously, it depends what the individual, who the individual is and where they are. Um, <clears throat> and I, I wouldn't say light bulbs or anything like that, you know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, I think it's very, it, it's, a, it's very much a personal uh, issue that you look to yourself, you are motivated, what motivates you, what drives you, uh, where are your passions, and um, that's then think about how you can take what you are and use it to contribute to something. You, there has to, we have to move away sort of from sort of hero narratives, you know, we are, I mean, this is where I like sort of the Donna Haraway thing. We are like little critters, you know. We are trying to be and in the trouble and in the chaos to contribute to a change in a little way, you know. Um, I, I, I have a, I'm reasonably old. I have a long story, some of which would surprise people if I told them, but I'm here now and I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> And sometimes I don't like doing what I'm doing, but I believe that I'm adding to, I don't think I'm making a huge difference, but I'm adding to change. Um, and it's, so I think it's something that you need to wrestle with. I think people need to wrestle with that. But the fact you even ask it is a big thing. The fact you even reflect on it and talk to people, even come here on a Wednesday evening is, is a key thing. Yeah, and you've got friends and you've got networks and, you know, uh, in, inform yourself and stuff, yeah. But, I, you know, I wouldn't say, dare say, do this, do that. You know. Linear triumphalism has a role. Uh, <laughs> it will continue to have a role uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And it's not to say it's either or, that's the thing. Um, it has a place, but I, my, what I'm trying to flag up here is how we foreclose different ways of seeing by only going with the, we're moving in this direction, we can achieve this, we must achieve this. And then, like I said earlier on, that uh, we then start to, through panic and desperation, undertake actions that are extremely damaging. Uh, I, and, and I think um, the self-interest and the inequity in power of those that are pushing some of this agenda 
uh, if we're looking at it through you know, the technologies and possibly moving towards extremes like geoengineering, which are, are, are really, like in the next five years, I think we could see um, justification for geoengineering at a political level. Um, because it's, it's been coming up the agenda anyway, and then after Paris, with the 1.5% target, suddenly all these geoengineer scientists and geoengineer companies and advocates re-emerged and were like, yep, we need, you know, we need to do stuff. And, and we're starting to get access to politicians and investors, and all you need is somebody with deep pockets who likes the idea of... Um, uh, putting iron filings in the ocean uh, to sequester carbon and then you're away, you know. Uh, it just, that's all it takes, you know. And the only thing that's holding that back is a moratorium between states under the Convention on Biological Diversity and also uh, a regulation in the um, London Protocol on, on the Law of the Sea about dumping um, waste. <laughs> so, so law is quite important. But it's tenuous, it's so tenuous. I, I think that another thing is that law is very fragile. I mean, we know that about human rights and, and how, you know, it fails on many fronts, but law is so fragile. Uh, it can go any direction at any point, depending on circumstances, you know. So I think, you know, vision and idea, but, but broadening, you know. Uh, guys are here. Changing in what way? Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. Um, in terms of uh, attention between the transit, the apo apo apocalyptic uh, scenarios and the the transition to um, a clean, green, ordered world. I see. I see this happening in a circle. There is. There is going to be the hurricane high ends. There is going to be slow onset um, loss and damage in terms of um, droughts, in terms of flooding. There is going to be displacement, and we'll get to the question about um, uh, definitions of uh, environmental refugees. That is going to take place alongside the continuation of investing in and attempting to 
create a world that is functioning in a post fossil fuel dependent way yeah so i don't i it's not an either or i don't <clears throat> i don't believe we're you know a sort of mad max world yet like come in and that's it uh, I think that these two are going to be occurring simultaneously. What concerns me more is that the climate change impacts, uh, the more apocalyptic side is happening and is going to happen more in uh, vulnerable, least developed countries that have the least capacity to <coughs> adapt and invest and as the cost of adaptation in developed countries increases, the willingness to invest in adaptation in least developed countries will go down. And I, I, that worries me a great deal, you know, because adaptation, the gap between mitigation and adaptation funding globally is very significant anyway. But if you just look at that in terms of domestic, there is a gap between mitigation and adaptation funding and if I mean when it happened here and there were flooding it's suddenly like oh we need to spend more on flood defenses and now we have a narrative of like well really we should be sending money overseas and overseas development assistance so <clears throat> I think the it will be happening at the same time but it's the geographies of it uh, where it's happening uh, which I think are more concerning because it's not equitable. Um, so you will also see a generation of lawyers that are really au fait with kind of, you know, new contracts on decentralizing energy systems, et cetera, et cetera, in areas where it is more stable and there's a creation and a move to uh, low carbon transition uh, energy systems and maybe smart, uh, agricultural systems and then other areas where we're into sort of disaster management and you know uh, disaster response which uh, is going to be a very different scenario um, definition of environmental refugees and then we've got climate change refugees <clears throat> there isn't a definition of uh, environmental refugees the refugees definitions according to uh, the Convention on Refugees in the 1950s is, is basically uh, political uh, refugees. And then you have, um, you know, impacts from war, et cetera, et cetera. But the, 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 the issue is, is that if, how do you define somebody that has become a refugee through climate change? They may have become a refugee because of conflicts as a result of climate change or partially as a result of climate change. So they could be qualify in that sense as a refugee and then somebody else could lose their, uh, lose their land, um, their livelihoods on land because of drought and then they'll be an economic refugee and then they wouldn't actually uh, be able to uh, claim refugee status, you know. And I think, I mean, there's lots of, I read a very interesting paper, which will circulate, uh, about <clears throat> loss and damage and um, climate change displacement. And the, the idea that um, displaced peoples could claim for loss and damage, this is something that happened in the Second World War, um, that people also managed to get restitution for lost property. But loss and damage in terms of movement, loss of uh, livelihood, uh, loss of stability, from having to move due, through no fault of their own. But again, it comes down with loss and damage. It comes down to um, causation and proving, you know, uh, under sort of classic legal systems. But I think again, you know, like when be very interested there's some discussions going on around this uh, at the fringes of the debates on loss and damage within the UNFCCC and uh, you can go onto the UNFCCC website and there's a loss and damage section and you can look there and uh, look at current negotiations about what should be included in terms of monitoring 
<clears throat> loss and damage. So, yeah. Uh, Heathrow. Uh, people were very excited, basically, <laughs> about the Vienna uh, judgment and the consultations around Heathrow. Is, uh, Sorry, could you just break this down? Heathrow. Vienna. Oh. Vienna. Uh, yeah, the Vienna airport, as I said, was the that there was a plan for a third runway uh, at an airport in Vienna and uh, there was a challenge to it basically by uh, a climate change lobby group and they challenged the uh, public interest of having a third runway and they won that case because uh, the judge found in their favour that the uh, economic benefits of a runway were um, less than uh, the climate change impacts and therefore they couldn't justify a new runway. runway. So it's very similar to Heathrow. Like, it's just like it's an excellent parallel case. Uh, <clears throat> what's likely to happen is they'll have the consultations, then a decision will be made and it's after that point that you uh, are likely to get some uh, mobilisation uh, for a case. There are already... Uh, solicitors and barristers and legal folk um, lining up and sort of trying to develop those um, cases. So it, don't be, yeah, there's likely to be more than one case as well. It's, it's it'll go on planning, but there'll be a, I, I would suspect there'll be a climate case like, on pretty similar to Vienna. Whether Vienna gets overturned or not, because I'm sure Vienna is going to get overturned. Again, it's about litigation moving ahead, changing the narrative, you know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so renewable energy, rather than, well, just faith in renewables, yeah. Um, <clears throat> renewables are, I think, definitely, uh, I, I don't have an issue about renewables. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> see if I came across like that. But uh, uh, I think it's, again, <laughs> scale and ownership um, like for example <clears throat> like the work that I'm doing in well, about the EU and energy policy is about decentralization of energy systems and um, energy communities establishing energy communities so that they can generate energy sell enough energy to uh, basically bring in an income but not with the ambition of becoming the biggest uh, renewable energy provider in Europe. Um, <clears throat> whereas what we are seeing is some of the big companies, including oil uh, and gas companies, investing heavily in renewables and buying up small companies and taking up that space, uh, you know, in a very sort of classic capitalist manoeuvre, you know, that this is a market opportunity, we can get in there, economies of scale, we can produce more and quicker, and um, Elon Musk is definitely along those lines, you know, so you might go, that's great, the technology is great, but he's, he's, he's the sort of equivalent of an Apple's uh, phone, you know, you'll rent the roof off them, you'll put it up and you'll pay a bit and, and it'll, everybody will have an Elon Musk roof, you know, that's the idea of, <laughs> now you can either go, that's what we need to do, you know, that's like we don't have enough time. Or you can think that's part of the problem. You know, that, I mean, I don't, I'm not professing to say it's that or that. But yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. It does, sorry, I'm just going to say one other thing. In uh, many least developed countries, the investment in renewable energy, like solar particularly, um, is from foreign uh, companies. And so ownership of the infrastructure is controlled by foreign companies. And so money is going out of the countries, whereas that doesn't need to happen. And it's not going to help in terms of uh, wider investment to address things like adaptation. You know?
just want to make a brief note about something that uh, Faya mentioned. There is an uh, event tomorrow night, uh, which the Law, Environment, and Development Center is hosting. It's uh, on the role of strategic litigation in implementing the Paris Agreement uh, at from 7 to 8.30. Um, and it's in the Brunei Gallery, uh, 111. Yeah, if yeah. any of you are interested. Yeah. Um, is Hannah here? Yeah, great. Hannah is, um, I don't know if any of you, well, if any of you came to the, uh, we had a climate concert in January called Significantis with uh, pianist Lola Perrin. Extremely inspiring, um, kind of uh, inspiring, uh, bringing forward new approaches to how we can think about climate change, how the arts can also be a way of conveying the necessity for climate action. Hannah's doing a project on that. If any of you came to that event, please approach Hannah after the seminar. Uh, she'd like to just ask a few questions. Um, One more thing. Yep. Uh, <coughs> also tomorrow, and I think it's in here uh, at eight, is uh, decolonizing the environment. Are you doing this? <laughs> uh, I'm chairing it. Uh, and uh, there's an anthropologist whose name I forget from is very interesting uh, using uh, app technology with indigenous peoples. Oh, Jerome Lewis, that's his name. Um, he's coming, he's going to be talking. Uh, a guy in EA who is from CDEP, who's talking about his work on um, climate change, forestry, and Nigeria. And uh, there's some people from Black Lives Matter and some other people. I can't remember who they are. But that's at 8 o'clock. So it's a balancing act, it's 7 o'clock. Litigation in here for decolonization, and then maybe go away and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Let's give Faye another round of applause.